Welcome to you all. We're welcoming you, women members of women-led or majority women forest and farm producer organizations from all 10 countries that the FFF is currently supporting. This event is really for you. Um, this dialogue is the first of a whole series of virtual dialogues that the FFF IAD team would like to offer to women members of producer organizations on diverse topics around women's entrepreneurship and empowerment. So the objective of this dialogue is to create a platform for women like you, uh, producers, entrepreneurs, and leaders, where you can connect with each other, share and exchange in your experiences and ideas, support and inspire each other around women's empowerment in your own context. Um, each dialogue will have a particular theme or a topic, but always with a connection to women's empowerment issues. And the topic of our first dialogue event is entrepreneurial and leadership mentoring and peer-to-peer -peer learning. So opportunities which allow women entrepreneurs and leaders to have access to experienced mentors and coaches who can provide guidance and support as they build and grow their businesses and leadership. Uh, we will hear about three very interesting mentoring and peer-to-peer -peer learning initiatives. And on this note, I would also very much like to welcome our uh, four speakers today. Um, I hope they're with us. I can't see all of the participants, but um, our four speakers today are Ms. Varsha Mehta from the Self-Employed Women's Association joining us from India, Madame Rose Massou from the African Women's Network for Community Management in Forests, so Zefakov joining us from Cameroon, um, Ms. Dunya El Kouri from the Women's Association of Deir El Ahmar, and uh, also a member of the Weekend Network, joining us from Lebanon, uh, who will then be introduced by um, Ms. Lucia Gerbaldo from FAO, who coordinates the Weekend Network. And we will hear a little bit more about this network from Lucia shortly. After the presentations, we will have some time to discuss the topic of entrepreneurial and leadership mentoring and peer-to-peer -peer learning in smaller groups. And we hope that within these smaller group discussions, we'll be able to collectively generate some recommendations on how women producer organizations, businesses and leaders could be supported through appropriate mentoring and peer-to-peer -peer learning opportunities. And um, I'm not certain because I cannot see all of the participants, but um, there might also be some um, females FFF steering committee members joining us um, in this meeting or other women leaders from our wider FFF network who bring a wealth of knowledge and insights to share and who will guide us in our future gender focused work within the FFF. So warm welcome to, um, to all of you as well. <clears throat> So before we dive into our presentations, I just wanted to say a few words um, on the gender-related work in the FFF and to put this event into context and to set the scene for our presentations and discussions today. Um, so despite major progress in reducing overall global poverty levels, new research shows a feminization of poverty, meaning that women are still at a greater risk of slipping into or remaining in poverty. And this is especially true in the agriculture and forest sectors. Even though women play important roles along agriculture and forest value chains, they suffer large gender inequalities uh, in access to agricultural assets, inputs, services, new technology, information and markets, and to the control of the products and income from their sale. And this causes very large costs to their countries, communities, and households. Uh, the FFF has as its main focus the strengthening of forest and farm producer organizations, or we call them FFPOs. Formal and informal producer organizations can help rural communities overcome poverty and facilitate their access to resources, assets, markets, and services. And women-only producer organizations can be crucial where existing producer organizations are restricted to men or where it is culturally not foreseen for men and women to sit together and jointly negotiate and make decisions. 
However, women only groups often remain limited to the local level. And in mixed organizations, on the other hand, women may be well represented as members, but few of them actually occupy leadership positions. So generally women are often excluded or poorly represented in such organizations, which tends to reinforce existing gender inequalities. Um, gender equality is however central to the forest and farm facility in achieving the goal of equitable livelihoods and sustainable landscapes. And as part of the FFF gender strategy, we therefore aim to offer events such as this to allow women for peer-to-peer, -peer, that is women-to-women -women, learnings and exchange of knowledge and experiences. Finding ways to reconcile um, family and work life is a challenge for working women everywhere. Uh, but we know that greater empowerment of women can lead to greater public investments in childcare, education, and health. And this, in turn, has many positive effects on women's livelihoods and well beings, and indeed everyone's livelihoods and well beings. Um, issues of gender often touch on very sensitive and controversial topics, including the division of labor in the, at the family level or the treatment of gender by religion. However, gender equality in business is often a more acceptable entry point for reducing women's vulnerability and empowering their status within organizations and households. Uh, women's economic empowerment through entrepreneurship is an entry point to other forms of empowerment. And it is also one of the most important factors contributing to equality between women and men. So this dialogue series um, therefore really focuses on women's entrepreneurial empowerment. And for this event, we have selected the topic of mentorship and peer-to-peer -peer learning, as it can be a very valuable tool for women entrepreneurs and leaders um, by providing guidance and support, networking opportunities, skill development, confidence building, and accountability to women's goals, own goals and commitments. But to make this dialogue series useful and relevant for you, we have also asked you prior to this event to name topics you would like to see covered in future learning events such as this. And we will draw from your feedback as we develop new dialogues in the future. So after these few observations and introductions, um, I would now like to give the floor to our first speaker, Ms. Varsha Mehta. Um, I hope she is joined us online. She's here with us. Um, a few words on Vasha. She is an independent researcher from India. Since completing her postgraduate degree in forestry management in 1994, she has worked on projects focusing on food and livelihood security, natural resource management, and gender equity with UN agencies, the World Bank, and NGOs such as Teddy, the Aga Khan Foundation, and SEBA. Um, she also volunteers for organizations with a rights-based agenda. So Vasha will introduce us to the Manager Nee School, which is an initiative by the Self-Employed Women's Association, SEWA, in India, aiming to help its many women micro-entrepreneur members develop leadership and business skills. Um, so welcome, Vasha. Over to you. You have 10 minutes for your presentation. And just a quick reminder to everyone, to help our interpreters do their job, please speak slowly and clearly. Thank you very much. Over to you, Vasha. Thank you very much, uh, Kata. Um, it is uh, indeed an honor for me to uh, talk about the Seva Manager Ni School uh, and uh, Seva per se. Uh, Seva is the self-employed women's association and uh, it, it has a legacy of over 50 years with a number of uh, um, very uh, critical leaders who have founded this uh, organization and uh, seen it grow. So uh, I will try to do justice to this uh, organization in the 10 minutes that I have. So Seva Managerni School, which actually means uh, Seva's School for Manager, is probably the only organization of its kind in India, possibly in Asia, which is working towards uh, building the managerial and leadership capacities 
of women micro entrepreneurs. Seva Manager in School uh, includes members who are engaged primarily in agriculture and livestock rearing, but uh, also occupations such as weaving, embroidery, tailoring, and a range of other micro enterprises. Uh, now, with its focus on uh, women micro entrepreneurs, particularly women and, and, and in sectors that are uh, categorized as the informal economy. Uh, this gives, uh, this, this places Seva in a, in a place that is very niche and very important for women empowerment. And uh, the, the organization Seva Managerni School was established as an independent arm of Seva in the year 2005. And uh, uh, it's the, the purpose of establishing this was to upskill and capacitate members of SEVA in response to a demand that came from the members. Now, I've been referring to SEVA on and off. For the benefit of the listeners, let me share here a little bit about SEVA. It's the Self-Employed Women's Association, which is a registered national level trade union of women workers. And uh, it has been in existence now for over 50 years, registered in the year 1972 by Ila Bain Bhatt, who was a visionary lawyer and the founder of SEVA. Now, over the course of the last 18 uh, years, since uh, formation of SMS, there have been many significant developments and milestones in the growth of uh, SMS or the SEVA Manager in School. Uh, what is common across all of them, I've listed a few bullet points, but I'm not going to read each of them. What I want to draw out here is the commonality that, that is visible to an outsider in what is recognized as a milestone is the involvement of a partner with expertise in management training. And all of these were, they were not accidental, these milestones. Seva Managerni School and Seva Leadership at uh, various points in their growth recognize the need for expertise and assessment of its um, of the work that it was doing or an assessment of the outcomes of the work that it was doing and received these inputs from uh, institutions such as uh, the premier management institutions in the country, such as the Indian Institute of Management, uh, the Institute for Rural Management, which is at Anand. Um, there's also the Rai Institute, which was uh, instrumental in developing the mini MBA program that SEVA offers. And that was the start of a lot of um, uh, management related training modules that SEVA continues to offer today. In terms of uh, financial assistance, the World Bank has been a regular uh, supporter, uh, including the World, uh, the World Bank Institute. Uh, next, please. Now, um, to, to understand uh, how uh, uh, to understand the training and capacity building model of uh, SMS, we first need to understand the institutional model of SEVA. And what we have here, what I have here on the uh, slide is a, a representation of a district level association. Uh, and I'm going to talk about a little bit uh, about its structure and the methods of functioning. Now, while SEVA is a national entity, the district level associations are autonomous bodies that are federated uh, at the national level. So um, decision-making across various districts and in Gujarat, in the state of Gujarat, they operate in nine districts, they have these associations in nine districts. Uh, they take their decisions independently and uh, the the decision-making body at the district level is called the Karobari uh, or the executive committee. Now that is supported by uh, uh, a, a group of uh, individuals who have expertise in different thematic areas. 
and uh, is led by a person that who is known as the district coordinator. Now, point to be noted is that all of the members of the district team are also members of SEVA. So SEVA manager ni school, while it is building the capabilities of its members, uh, there, there are two things that are happening simultaneously in this uh, in the SEVA structure and the, um, the training model. For different occupations that the members practice, they have a, uh, what is known as a trade committee, a dhanda samiti, which is a representative body of uh, members selected by the grassroots members at the district level. And there is another uh, representative body, which is the Pratinidhi Mandal, or, which includes representatives from across all the trades. Now, this might sound a little bit confusing, but the idea is to, uh, to have, I mean, there are two structures that seem to be parallel, but they actually converge at the district level. The trade committees focus on specific occupations, and the uh, the representative body, the Pratinidhi Mandal, is where all the different trades converge. And uh, members of the Pratinidhi Mandal therefore take up issues that are uh, that are originating from the grassroots through the uh, Danda Samitis and right up to the district level. If there are any clarifications that are sought on this, I'll, I'll be happy to respond to questions on that. But uh, this had to be put forward to be able to explain the training model. Next, please. Now, in terms of scale, uh, I think it is important to uh, recognize that uh, SEVA is, uh, I mean, SEVA of course is a national entity, but uh, in terms of the numbers of members, uh, just to give you an idea, the, the Ahmedabad District Association alone has up to 60,000 plus members. And uh, the numbers continue to increase every year. So we are really talking about a very large uh, spread out uh, organization and uh, a, a, a staggered training model that they are following. Um, so how, within the, within the uh, state, the way it operates is that at the village level, members, new members who are enrolled, they receive training from the village leaders. And these village leaders are called Agewan. Uh, however, Agewan is also a term that is used for all leaders within the uh, Seva terminology and organization. But for now, let us say village leaders, they uh, provide the training to the members. Now, the village leaders are trained by master trainers and this happens at the sub-district level. Usually there is a, a, a CLBRC as they call it, a community learning and business resource center, which operates uh, just, uh, so the way it, it works is that village level trainings, two members are provided by the village leaders. The village leaders receive training from master trainers at the district and the sub-district level. And the master trainers in turn undergo rigorous training um, at, at Ahmedabad where uh, the training is provided by the SMS fac faculty. Now, a little bit about the training that the master trainers receive. It is. It consists of about three days, uh, two to three days every month over a year. And uh, during this, the master trainers who are actually the training facilitators at the lower level, they receive inputs, they practice uh, the training themselves, they receive feedback and continue to work on improving their skills of training. Now, what is the kind of training that the master trainers undergo? We'll look at it in the next slide, please. So there is this concept that uh, 
Seva has, SMS has, which is called a training ladder. Now, a training ladder is something that every master trainer is required to go through. These are the basic compulsory uh, training modules uh, and trainings that every master trainer is required to go through. It starts with the first, right after enrollment as a member, and the first is member education. So as a member of SEVA, what are the values that uh, you uphold? What are the values that we work towards? How do we build the organization? Um, related to that, and because this is uh, uh, an organization that is founded on principles of, um, of decentralized decision-making, women empowerment, and the philosophy that Ila Bainbhat uh, has uh, believed in. So the next few trainings are about how to mobilize members, how to, uh, how to approach women, get them interested in the organization, get them interested in learning new skills, to, um, uh, to share with them, to sensitize them to their rights and uh, entitlements. And thereafter, um, there are a few training modules wherein the, the focus is on the trainer and how the trainer presents herself. So there are things like, uh, you know, platform skills and presentation skills, even grooming skills uh, that are there. That, that further moves on to problem solving, decision making, and every member who I spoke with, what they mentioned was, um, you know, the importance of these trainings in their own life. So, while they are learning this as master trainers to be able to pass on the, uh, the training to members at, at, at various levels in the organization, personally, every member has benefited from the training that she has received. Okay, so the key characteristics of the uh, training and learning model, they fall into four broad categories. The first is to do with members' access to training. Uh, the trainings are organized at the, uh, and, and here I'm referring to the members at the village level, the micro entrepreneurs that we are training. The training is free for them. It responds to a felt need. It is conducted in the village where the participants feel most comfortable and have easy access. Uh, none of the sessions is longer than two hours. It, Typically, it is one to one and a half hour session. So it saves them time and resources. The second aspect is to do about the training per se. Uh, the, because the trainer is a local, she uses the local language and dialect and examples that the members and the trainees can relate with. The training itself relies on a mix of methods catering to different uh, um, different ways that people learn. Uh, it uses audiovisual tools, role play, observation, demonstration, depending on the topic uh, of the training. And more recently, SMS has also introduced the hybrid mode where uh, members can receive part training offline and part training uh, uh, online. And then there is the self-learning format for the new generation members on specific uh, training topics. The third aspect, uh, the third key aspect is about the design of training. Each training module is standardized and carefully designed. It takes up to six months for a module from, uh, for, for the finalization of a module from an idea to something that can be uh, delivered uh, as a training. And even then, it is not considered um, final. Fi I mean, even after it is fi final and being used in the field, every time there is feedback, the uh, intermittently the modules are revisited, reviewed, and improved upon to reflect the realities and feed feedback from the field. And most importantly, which is what makes the training very, very effective, is uh, post-training support, and that happens to be also the theme of today's discussion. This is, uh, you know, members, the trainees, they receive post-training mentorship from the village leaders who are the 
who are also the trainers that provided them training. And this is not limited to any particular, uh, you know, a few weeks after training or such. For example, if it is about uh, um, uh, cultivation of a particular crop, that mentorship support lasts through the cropping cycle. Um, so it's it's an ongoing mentorship, and that that is only possible because this is not just a training that uh, this is not being done just as a training, but it is part of an institution building process. And people who are inducted as members, they know that they are here for good. Um, I, I I realize that uh, time is short, so I'm going to rush through the next uh, couple of slides. Maybe you can give me a minute extra because of the disturbance. Uh, yes, one more minute. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, in terms of uh, financial sustainability of the model, SMS is able to raise 10 to 20% of its financial resources uh, through trainings. The training that the master trainers undergo is all paid. Uh, remember, I mentioned that members at the village level are not paying, but people who uh, receive the training and use it for training other members, they always pay for the training. And this takes care of about 10 to 20% of the finance, financial resources required. But the large part of funds are coming from project grants and trainings that are offered by SMS to other national and international agencies. Um, there is uh, brainstorming and strategizing going on to, uh, to, to, look, to, to move towards greater self-reliance in terms of funds. Next, please. Uh, there hasn't been any systematic, uh, I'm, I'm, I mean, it's, it's understandable, it's an organization that has been around for 50 years, uh, but uh, lately there is uh, talk about doing a systematic impact assessment Otherwise, there's hundreds of case studies that have been prepared and the difference between SEVA members and non-SEVA members is visible when one interacts with them. A few other indicators of the impact of the training or the effectiveness of the training is that members who have enrolled, they have to pay a membership fee every year and the renewal rate is, 80 to, is between 80 to 90% which is um, an indication of the usefulness that the members see from being members of SEVA. Uh, next, please. Uh, in terms of learnings, and this is especially uh, in the context of um, uh, greater financial uh, sustainability, it is felt that SMS needs to be able to provide some sort of a certification and recognition of the training that uh, is being provided. So it's, it's not just the skills that are important, but the certificate which says that so-and-so has undergone this training uh, because people would then be able to use those certificates when they are applying for jobs elsewhere. Uh, it is also, uh, um, a, a signal of the quality of training for people who do not know SEVA well. Um, so, so that's 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 important. Um, what has also been realized uh, through um, at the SMS approach is that mentoring and handholding support are absolutely critical. Uh, a holistic approach to training is uh, what is required and. That is the approach which they are following. Uh, they feel that it is important to also um, showcase the, out, the outreach and impact assessment uh, to be able to draw in new members and new trainees into the fold. Last slide after this, uh, in terms of the way forward, um, a community college is being considered, which will have appropriate um, accreditation from the government bodies and a further standardization of the curriculum and pedagogies uh, as also continuing education for uh, SMS core faculty. So that is all. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Basha. Thank you so much for this really inspiring presentation, a very impressive uh, example of mentoring and peer-to-peer -peer training. I was particularly impressed by the hierarchical structure of your training model, which really allows the training curricula to trickle down all the way from district to village level. And women being able to learn uh, from their peers in their own language, in their own setting, uh, when they're comfortable to do so and have time to do so. Also very impressed by the wide range of topics your master trainers are trained in uh, before they can call themselves master trainers. It's just sort of really highlighting um, um, just how many different capacities women leaders and entrepreneurs need to have and often struggle to have to be successful. So thank you so much for this. Um, I would now like to suggest to continue with our next presentation and reserve some time afterwards to give our presenters the chance to answer your questions in our Q&A session if we have time. Um, please also feel free to post your questions in the chat function um, and I ask our presenters to keep an eye on that um, and answer um, um, questions uh, to them. So with this, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Ms. Rose pelagie Masso. Uh, Rose holds a Diploma of Advanced Studies in Economic Policy Management and has 19 years of experience in sustainable development. She has participated in a range of uh, professional training courses on sustainable natural resource management, gender issues, local economic development, conservation, and others. She is currently the regional coordinator in charge of cooperation and planning of the African Women's Network for Community Forest Management, of EFACOF. Rose is also the deputy national coordinator of the NGO Cameroon Ecologie. Rose will take us slightly away from entrepreneurial leadership to talk about peer-to-peer -peer mentoring for advocacy leadership in the form of women leadership circles in agricultural and natural resource management. Um, Rose will present in French, so you can hear um, uh, the, the English and uh, Spanish interpretation by clicking on the appropriate channels. Uh, bienvenue Rose, uh, je vous donne la parole, vous avez 10 minutes, merci beaucoup. Ok, merci Kata de me passer la parole. Euh, dans le cadre de cette rencontre, je vais partager avec vous les expériences des cercles de femmes leaders en agriculture et la gestion des ressources naturelles, les Clarènes en abrégé. Next, prochaine diapositive. Et dans mon intervention, je vais parler d'une petite introduction. Est-ce qu'on peut passer à la prochaine diapositive, s'il vous plaît? Donc, dans l'introduction, je vais faire une très brève présentation de Rifakov, les femmes dans le secteur forestier et agricole en Afrique, puis l'historique de la création des clarènes. Ensuite, l'accompagnement des clarènes, notamment l'approche et les dynamiques de mobilisation. Ensuite, les principaux résultats et apprentissages. Et dans la conclusion, nous allons apporter les principaux constats et les perspectives. En guise d'introduction, il faut dire que le RIFACOF, est-ce qu'on peut aller à la prochaine diapositive? J'espère que vous me suivez. Oui, absolument. Continuez. Ok, d'accord. Donc, en guise d'introduction, je vais dire que le RIFACOF a été créé en 2009 à Yaoundé et est composé de 20 pays membres, dont les pays membres d'Afrique centrale, Afrique de l'Ouest et Madagascar. Et nous sommes une plateforme de plaidoyer sur les droits fonciers et forestiers de la femme rurale africaine. Prochaine diapositive. Est-ce qu'on peut avancer? Next slide, please. Prochaine diapositive. Bon, de toute façon, voilà, la prochaine diapositive vous montre tout simplement les différents pays membres de l'EFACOF. Et je vous disais tantôt que nous sommes pays, un pays membre. Prochaine diapo. Diapo. Euh, par rapport à la création historique de la création des clarins, et elle part de, du constat des problèmes et défis auxquels font face les femmes 
Et à la suite de ce constat, le RIFACOP s'est rendu à l'évidence que les femmes ont besoin d'appui pour s'organiser, échanger leurs connaissances entre elles, accroître leur pouvoir économique et leur capacité en leadership, en négociation et plaidoyer pour influencer les politiques dans leur environnement. Donc c'est ainsi que le RIFACOP met sur place le programme leadership dont l'une des principales composantes porte sur les clarettes. Et les clarettes, ce sont les cercles de femmes leaders en agriculture et la gestion des ressources naturelles. Cette initiative voit le jour en 2015 au Cameroun grâce à l'appui financier de Wokan. Et deux ans plus tard, en 2017, le RIFACOP a également été appuyé par le FFS pour continuer ce travail. On avance, c'est à pour. Par rapport à l'approche de création des clarins et la dynamique de mobilisation, euh, nous avons six principales étapes. Nous avons commencé par une étude sur la prise en compte du char dans les documents de stratégie de développement rural au Cameroun. Et ensuite, cette étude a été restituée avec l'élaboration d'une feuille de route pour euh, la mise en œuvre des recommandations. Ensuite, nous avons fait le choix des zones pilotes et identifié les parties prenantes. Après quoi, nous avons informé, sensibilisé et formé les femmes sur l'approche clarette, sur le leadership et sur le plaidoyer. C'est à pour. On avance. Au fait, c'est quoi euh, les, les clarènes et pour quelle finalité? Les clarènes, c'est pour soutenir la mobilisation des femmes leaders et rurales en faveur de la défense de leurs droits et leur intégration active dans les projets et programmes développés dans les secteurs de l'agriculture et des ressources naturelles. De manière singulière, il s'agit de structurer et de renforcer les capacités des femmes rurales actives en agriculture et dans la gestion des ressources naturelles et de faire émerger parmi elles des leaders capables de parler avec autorité au nom de leur père. On avance. Diapo, s'il vous plaît. Est-ce qu'on peut avancer et comme principaux résultats et changements observés, il faut déjà dire que nous avons commencé par une cartographie des acteurs actifs dans la gestion des ressources naturelles et nous avons produit un répertoire de ces différents cas. Donc, à ce jour, nous avons six clarins au niveau du Cameroun, deux deux au niveau de la Excusez-moi, Rose, excusez-moi, notre entre, entre, entrepreneur Prater a des petits problèmes, des petits soucis de vous entendre. Est-ce que vous pouvez parler un peu plus, un peu plus ah. fort, s'il vous plaît? D'accord, merci. merci. D'accord. OK, je disais donc au niveau des, au niveau des résultats, nous avons aujourd'hui six clarins au niveau du Cameroun et deux clarins au niveau de la Gambie et du Liberia. Et ça, c'est uniquement ce que nous avons mentionné ici, mais il faut déjà noter qu'il existe également un clarène au Togo, un clarène en Côte d'Ivoire et un clarène en RPC. Comme changement observé, on peut constater que les femmes ont développé des capacités et des aptitudes et mènent des activités de plaidoyer pour la défense et la prise en compte de leurs droits et intérêts dans les politiques et les mécanismes en lien avec l'agriculture et la gestion des ressources naturelles. Est-ce qu'on peut avancer? J'espère que je suis audible maintenant. Est-ce que vous m'entendez? On, on, on a encore un petit souci. Il y a, il y a beaucoup, de, beaucoup de bruit là derrière. Je ne sais pas si ah. c'est possible de, de changer le micro, peu, oui. de se mettre plus un... proche. Un moment, s'il vous plaît. Oui. Est-ce qu'on peut... Ça va mieux maintenant? Hein? Je pense que c'est mieux. OK. D'accord. Donc, je disais tantôt qu'aujourd'hui, nous avons six clarènes au niveau du Cameroun. Euh, 
un Claren en Gambie et un au Liberia. Ça, c'est exactement ce que nous avons mentionné ici, mais il faut également noter que nous avons un Claren au Togo, un Claren en Côte d'Ivoire et un Claren en RDC. Et par rapport aux changements observés, les femmes ont développé des capacités et des aptitudes et mènent des activités de plaidoyer pour la défense et la prise en compte de leurs droits et intérêts dans les politiques et les mécanismes en lien avec l'agriculture et la gestion des ressources naturelles. Est-ce qu'on peut avancer? Diapo. Oui, c'est ainsi que vous pouvez observer à travers ces images ici les femmes mobilisées pour la revendication de leurs droits fonciers au Togo pour avoir euh, acquis un renforcement des capacités. Elles sont aujourd'hui à même de défendre elles-mêmes leurs droits. Donc, voilà une séance de sensibilisation où les femmes sont en train de revendiquer leurs droits fonciers. Suivante. Diapo. OK, on avance. Prochaine diapositive, s'il vous plaît. C'est exactement oui, ce qui se passe là-bas. Au niveau encore des changements, on peut constater qu'ils s'observent à deux niveaux, à savoir sur la structuration et le fonctionnement des clarènes, ainsi que le développement des activités collectives. Par rapport à la structuration et au fonctionnement des clarènes, nous avons aujourd'hui, est-ce qu'on peut monter au niveau de la diapo suivante? Prochaine diapositive. Oui, là, nous avons des femmes qui sont de mieux en mieux organisées et mieux structurées. Elles ont aujourd'hui des textes de base grâce à l'accompagnement qu'elles ont reçu. Elles tiennent des, des réunions mensuelles, hebdomadaires ou trimestrielles encore et elles sont mieux structurées. Elles font des efforts pour respecter leur statut et règlement intérieur. Là, vous avez des associations de femmes au niveau du Cameroun, comme vous pouvez le constater en image. Suivant. Prochaine diapositive. OK. Et au niveau, les, les femmes mènent également des activités collectives, hein, c'est-à-dire au niveau de la production et de la transformation des produits. On avance. Prochaine diapositive, s'il vous plaît. OK. Là, vous avez les femmes au niveau du Cameroun, de la Côte d'Ivoire, du Togo, en RDC, qui sont organisées autour des activités champêtres. Elles ont les champs collectifs, par exemple, de Rachid, comme vous pouvez voir là où les femmes sont courbées, les bananeraies, les agro foresterie et là, vous avez une pépinière prête à être transplantée. Est-ce qu'on peut avancer? Prochaine diapositive. Oui, euh, nous avons parlé de la transformation également. Ici, par exemple, nous avons les associations de, de, de femmes, plus particulièrement des jeunes femmes hein, qui transforment des produits forestiers non lignés en rouge à lèvres, en savon. Vous avez également certaines qui transforment la pastèque, donc des fruits, pour la consommation. Prochaine diapositive. Est-ce qu'on peut avancer? Oui, et nous avons dit que les femmes sont de mieux en mieux organisées et mieux structurées. Là, par exemple, nous avons en image les femmes regroupées au niveau du Togo et en Côte d'Ivoire qui vendent de manière collective leurs produits. Donc, elles organisent des ventes groupées. Les ventes groupées leur permettent de minimiser les coûts par rapport à, au transport, par rapport à le, le prix sur le marché et elles peuvent bien négocier leur prix parce qu'elles sont en groupe. On avance. Prochaine diapositive. Et toujours en termes de changements observés, on constate aujourd'hui que grâce à l'accompagnement reçu de, reçu de Réfacof, quelques femmes leaders participent aujourd'hui 
dans les conseils municipaux grâce au dialogue établi entre les exécutifs communaux et les femmes leaders. On constate également l'intégration en cours dans quelques mairies des activités des femmes dans les budgets communaux, c'est-à-dire avec leur organisation mieux structurée comme elles sont, elles peuvent maintenant proposer des activités au niveau de leur commune et elles voient ces activités intégrées dans le plan de travail de la commune pour l'année. Et plus intéressant encore, nous avons quelques femmes qui sont devenues conseillères municipales et participent aujourd'hui à la prise de décision grâce à l'accompagnement reçu de Rifako. Et là, nous avons particulièrement le cas du Cameroun. On avance. Prochaine diapositive, s'il vous plaît. En guise de conclusion, et particulièrement comme principaux constats, nous, nous voyons que lorsque les femmes rurales bénéficient d'un encadrement adéquat, elles sont capables de mener les actions nécessaires pour relever les différents défis auxquels elles font face. Il ressort, il ressort également de l'expérience des Clarennes que la mobilisation, la structuration et le renforcement des capacités des femmes rurales restent un impératif. En guise de perspective, le Refacor voudrait continuer la mise en place des cercles des femmes leaders en agriculture et la gestion des ressources naturelles dans d'autres régions du Cameroun, en Gambie, au Libéria et pourquoi pas dans plusieurs autres pays membres du réseau. L'objectif à terme étant d'appuyer la mise en place des clarins nationaux et régionaux afin d'augmenter l'influence des femmes dans ces secteurs. Et enfin, le RIFACOF voudrait également soutenir le développement des entreprises forestières communautaires des femmes pour qu'elles puissent améliorer leur statut économique qui leur permet d'améliorer leur influence dans leur environnement. Et sur ce, je vous remercie de votre aimable attention. Merci beaucoup, Rose. Uh, thank you so much for this really interesting insight into an innovative way of providing a platform for women farmers to exchange with each other and to increase their capacities to influence decision-making processes that have an impact on their livelihoods. Um, I think it's also interesting to note that um, these women leadership circles provide a rare opportunity for government staff to interact directly with women producers. And it seems that through this direct interaction and mentoring, the Women Leadership Circle indeed seems to have acted as a sort of springboard for some women to become included in political decision-making processes and political committees. So very interesting. Um, thank you again. Merci encore. Um, with this, I would like to make the transition to our next speakers who have kindly joined us in this FFF event from outside our tight FFF network. I would like to introduce Ms. Lucia Gerbaldo from FAO Weekend and Ms. Dunya El Kouri um, from the Women's Association of uh, Dair El Ahmar. And Lucia will give us a quick introduction to what WeCan is and then give the floor to Dunya, who will present us the mentoring and peer-to-peer -peer work of her NGO WADA. So please, Lucia and Dunya, the floor is yours. You have 10 minutes. We look forward to your presentations. Thank you, Kata, and the Forest and Farm Facility for uh, the invitation, for creating these interesting women and men's space of discussion and collective uh, growth. Um, I would like to give you a brief, brief introduction of what we are doing as we can community knowledge practice to foster the women uh, leaders, voices, agencies, and leadership in the dryland forest and agroecological systems. We can is a mechanism for women empowerment to connect the south south practices and policies through mentorship, knowledge sharing, learning opportunities, and co outline advocacy actions. So we can 
then builds on the current women leaders' capacities, strengthening the women-led organizations, empowering them to raise their voices, increase their influence in high-level global discussions, such as the UNCCD COP15 and the UNFCCC COP27 last year. So we provide one-by-one -one mentoring support, the capacity development opportunities, and a mutual learning space. So the group of organizations can synergize um, their advocacy efforts, create consortium, co-create gender responsive projects uh, together. Uh, so in short, we uh, facilitate also the meaningful engagement uh, of the women leaders in decision-making processes on climate change, land restoration, and agro pastoral systems. So now I, I want to give the floor to our one of the most active members from Lebanon, Duniel Kuri. She is a founder and president of an NGO uh, named Women's Association of De Haramar, WADA. Uh, she has over then uh, 30 years of experience in directing programs, supporting women, women leaders in our community to be more involved in responsible tourism and agri-food sectors. So over to you, Dunia. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for being with you to this, on this day. It's a great opportunity to share our uh, vision and our experience together, all together. Uh, so um, I'm, uh, I'm very happy to be able to uh, present our experience uh, in the mentoring and the peer-to-peer -peer training. Uh, so we, I'm um, Dunya El Khuri, founder and president of the Women's Association of Dar Ahmar. It's a uh, Lebanese uh, non-governmental organization. Uh, established since 1994 in Del Ahmar. It's a town of uh, the Beka of Lebanon. Uh, and uh, WADA, uh, it's uh, the initiative of uh, WADA, was awarded the Dubai International Award for Best Practices to Improve the Living Environment uh, since the year 2002. Uh, what was our uh, mission and vision? WADA aims to provide an improved standard of living for all the residents of Del Ahmar uh, helping them solidify their local roots and providing more economic opportunities. How? We are asking how we can do it, how we can empower this local community. Uh, our, our initiative is in a, a very uh, uh, district, small district in, uh, in the Beka. Uh, yani we, are, we were trying to make the impact and uh, through our uh, intervention in this community, uh, we are uh, we were looking to uh, to improve uh, the living environment of uh, this community, and uh, because this is uh, Dar Ahmar is a rural area, and it's uh, with a semi-arid climate, it is a, a very very rich uh, area in the natural resources. Uh, we have uh, we are in a uh, in agricultural land of the Beka, and uh, we have a lot of um, uh, historical sites, but the local community uh, doesn't know what are those uh, resources are important. This is why we intervene and we try to open the eyes of the local community that you have a lot of resources. And this is how we uh, should struggle and we should uh, work to, uh, to improve our living environment. This is how, because we have the biodiversity, we have uh, uh, springs and uh, surrounding the area, we have forests in the area, uh, we have the cedars forest, we have the juniper forest. So it is a lot of resources in this area, but the people are living, uh, it's, it's a poor, really a very, very bad economic situation. This is how we intervene. And um, we, are, we try to support this community by involving specifically the women, the women of this area, because they didn't, uh, they weren't involved in the economic sector. They are just uh, women house, uh, housewives. Uh, so we try to empower them to be involved in the, com in the economic sector. And uh, what we, we focus on was our, our capacities, what our know-how, the local know-how, what they, this woman know to do, how we can improve their know-how. They are very well known for their uh, 
uh, for the agro food because we have, we have something which is called mune. Mune is the products prepared basic on our products of the, the farmers they, they have, you know, because we have uh, the fruits, we have the vegetables, we have everything. How we can conserve our products? This is the agro food process. They know this, they know they do it for their family, but how we can improve this by making them a product that we can sell. This is why we make a lot of training, capacity building, because this is how we began making those women learn how to improve these products, how they can make it a product that ca they can sell on the market. Then uh, we have uh, a lot of, uh, as I told you, we have a lot of uh, uh, natural and, uh, and uh, historical sites in the area. Uh, this is why we, we support them to go to reach those, space, those places, to know about those spaces. We, we make like a training to let them discover those resources and that the tourism sector also is a very important sector in this region. We are very close to the Baalbek uh, temples, which are Roman temples. We are about 15 kilometers, not so far. We are about 40 kilometers from the cedars of Lebanon, which is a very, very rich natural resources. Uh, we have uh, very religious sites. We have our leader of Bishwek, which is very close to our area. So we make this, this community aware about those natural resources. And this is how we build our trainings on what we have, how we can improve what we have, how we can enhance the women to go to, to work, to, 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 to make uh, better products, better handicrafts also, because we have the handicraft, the traditional handicraft. So what we try to do is to conserve our traditional know-how and to make our, our image, our local image, to conserve our local image because it's very important. We try also to conserve our food because we have a very recognized food in Lebanon. We have a very special, and in the area, we have our traditional and uh, natural uh, products and the food, the traditional food. This is why we build our training programs we were mentoring the people, we were mentoning the women to go through the, their own know-how, to improve their know-how and to build our economic uh, strategy on our uh, resources, built on our resources. And we try to work on a specific area, which is the town of my husband. I get married in this, to go to Der al Ahbar. I've been in the, on the Mediterranean seaside. So I, I moved to, to uh, agriculture land this is, I, and I really, I love this, uh, this community because they have, they conserve their traditions and we support them to conserve their know-how. This is very important to keep our image, to keep our traditions. This is very important and to keep our resources because the farmers are growing our vegetables, our fruits, how we can conserve this, uh, this uh, resources all over the year. This is the agro-food and we, uh, in the with the support of many partners, local, national, and international, we built a lot of partnership with local, uh, with ministries, with uh, with the EU, with other uh, uh, different uh, partners all over the world. I mean, they support us to build our community center. It's a rural development center where we are giving all these uh, opportunities for the local community on a long-term basis. So we built our center, we take the, the land from the municipality. The municipalities, we are very, uh, we are very uh, collaborating with the, the local authorities as well as the national level. So we have very good uh, communication and we, uh, we get a land where we come, we began to, to build our, uh, our community center responding to the needs of those uh, people who make the, the trainings with us, uh, the peer-to-peer -peer trainings. This is where we have our whole seminar hall. We have our kitchen to prepare the products and we receive visitors in our center to, mm. to enjoy mm. our local food. We mm. have our mm. production center. And uh, yani this is how, and we, we make bungalows to receive also visitors. We build also, we, we make the training for the, for the local communities, for the women of the area, for the, which are members also of WADA, to open their house as guest houses because tourism is a very, very important sector for women. It's not only about food and agro food. Women can be also involved in the tourism sector and it's very, very good 
uh, opportunities for her and a very good income generating for her and for her family, of course. This is how we open, uh, we make training for the women, we support them to open their house as guest houses. Uh, they manage their house and they improve uh, uh, the building and the uh, store. So we have 30 guest house, a network of 30 guest houses in the area to receive the visitors coming to uh, visit this area. So this is how we improve the uh, tourism sector and we support them to have these uh, guest houses as uh, green guest houses. We support them to, to put the solar energy for uh, hot water. Uh, we we make the rain for the solid waste, uh, uh, managing the solid waste. We, we bring for them the business to make the selection of so, so and so. So we, we try to find the needs of this community and we support them to improve their living environment. This is how we are now member of the DMO, the Destination Management Organization, which is supporting the rural tourism sector in the area. And we are also member of the Lebanese Council of Women at, at the national level. We are member of the National Com Commission for Lebanese Women, and we are part of the uh, making uh, the strategy of the Lebanese women. We, are, we have our opinion in the strategy now. And this is how we are moving from the local to the national. Then, in the support with the, the weekend also, we move to the international. So we, we get the opportunity to be member of the weekend to uh, the COP15. And uh, this is how from where I participated in the uh, CSO, I, uh, I uh, delivered the, the statement of the CSO concerning the gender issues. And we proposed the action plan during this uh, COP and the recommendations concerning the uh, gender and the, the woman action plan. This is how we can move. And I remember also at, with the national delegation uh, of the Lebanese delegation to the COP27 to Sharam Sheikh. This is how we are moving from the grassroots to the national and international level. And this is how we are bringing the global from the COPs where we have the recommendations, when we, where we know about what is going on to the local. Now, when I come back, we have a lot of pre preparing, a lot of projects concerning the renewable energy, concerning the biodiversity, concerning uh, uh, the forest concerning all the themes that are discussed during those COPs, we are trying to Im improve and to involve the local communities and to put them uh, aware about what is going uh, all over the world and the challenges that are facing the world. This is how we continually in our center. Yesterday, we have a training concerning the biodiversity, uh, concerning the bees keeping uh, the products of the bees. So it is a continual process going on to support women, especially women and youth with the farmers also, but especially women. We are focusing on women empowerment, especially on women economic empowerment. At the same time, the, push, uh, the women as decision making, we are part of the Lebanese Council of Women. They are supporting uh, the participation of women in the political life. So it is a uh, uh, integrated uh, uh, process. This is how we are, we are uh, getting uh, uh, this methodology to support mentoring and women leadership. We have a lot of women, they are leaders now. They, are, uh, they have their own business. They have their own cup. A lot of women that uh, have uh, uh, training, making the training with us, mentoring and uh, and the trainings, so they are now really uh, leader and they can uh, also have their own business and their own uh, projects. I don't know if I have more time or it's... Uh... <laughs> I'm afraid we've run out of time, but I can see there are lots of, lots of people commenting and um, we will provide a participant list um, at the end of this so that people can directly contact you um, also for for any further clarifications. Thank you so much, Dunya, and thank you so much, uh, Lucia. I think this is really interesting to hear about how we can support um, increasing um, women's leadership in international fora, such as the COP climate negotiations. And we certainly hope that um, the FFF and we can, can join forces in the future in empowering women producers' voices to be heard loud and clear. And very inspiring also to hear about um, 
how in the case of Dunya's organization WADA, the women in the community are invited to decide on a wide range of services that the center offers to the community are then offered opportunities to receive training relevant to these services. So gradually activating their role in the sustainable development of their community. Um, at this point, I would like to thank all our presenters for their contributions and insights. Um, we have uh, heard about three very different initiatives, but all with a focus on empowering women entrepreneurs or leaders through mentoring and peer-to-peer -peer training. So thank you for these quick introductions. Um, I We have slightly uh, <laughs> shifted our agenda because we've, we've run out of time for a, a long Q&A session, but perhaps we have time for one question. Uh, and then I would like to move on to the next um, next point in our agenda. And I can see one hand up from Haija Lima, please. Good afternoon from all of you. I want to thank you for the opportunity to create that you've created for this training. It's a very good one. And I want to appreciate that, especially all the speakers. I think that uh, they shared what we all need to know moving forward. As an organization, I just want to, I don't actually have a question, but just to appreciate that what they are doing is what the way we should go. And we have been also intentional about getting young women, men taught, into looking at the issues of agriculture and forest management. It is very important. Currently, we have a lot of young women that we are adding on to the change, the leadership agenda, but with the entrepreneurship as part of securing their economic security. And it's very important. And I want to appreciate that. I've learned a lot from the presentation that is going to add up to the models that we are developing for our young ladies. Especially currently, we have up to 400 tertiary university agri students that we are working with to get them to understand why they need to take entrepreneurship part of their agri instead from production into the uh, uh, supply into the market as a big entrepreneurship agenda and make money out of it so that the leadership training we are providing them they will be able to make it meaningful because you can't be a leader if you don't have economic power. So we are trying to combine the two and get them to understand why they need necessarily to understand the environment they work and protect the environment, get plants ready, get their leadership set, and together they can be able to make change that they are looking for. And this we are doing it also through the mentoring. So we have put up a, a mentorship academy and we are training them consciously and deliberately to be able to be really sustainable when it comes to forest and farm producer issues. And we have a lot of them that are currently even pick up farming and they are thinking that they are making a lot of headway, which I think is good. The mentorship is the way to go and we need to really be intentional about it and get it to the level that we'll get the young people. The next generation is very important in this argument. And we need to make sure that we are picking them along when it comes to looking at leadership and training and getting them to keep the environment safe and protect and benefit from it. So thank you very much. And thank you for all the presenters. Thank you. Yes. Thank you also for me. Thank you. Thank you, Haija. Um, very, very wonderful to hear this, this encouragement and to hear a little bit about your own activities and initiatives. And um, as I said, I'm speaking from Ghana, sorry, I didn't yes, add it. Yes, I'm speaking from Ghana, and we are yeah. members yeah. of the Weekend com Learning Community of yes. Learning. I just want to establish that. Yes. It's very yes. important. Yes. 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 Um, and as I said, this is really a platform, and I really hope that this will also be an opportunity for you to engage with each other once the event is over, which will be soon, and which um, means that I would really like to move on to the next part of our agenda, which is a small discussion in smaller circles. So we would like to break out now into three different rooms, um, uh, an English, French, and Spanish, uh, Spanish speaking room um, to discuss amongst ourselves some of the challenges and solutions around women entrepreneurial leadership mentoring. Um, so as you can see, um, we have put up three questions, which we would like you all to discuss amongst ourselves. And um, we will be facilitating the discussion, um, but would also like to, um, for each group to nominate a rapporteur, someone who will take some notes during the discussion and then re report back to us um, as we join the plenary. 
we have slightly, um, as I said, we're slightly behind our schedule. So I'm really hoping that you can stick around for an additional 10 minutes um, and, and really participate in this discussion and hear also what, what other groups have come up with. Um, so um, I would now like us, maybe I just read out the questions so we're all aware of them. So the three questions are, what challenges do women producers face in becoming entrepreneurs and leaders? Question number one. Question number two, how can peer-to-peer -peer learning and mentoring address some of these challenges? And question number three, what type of peer support um, in terms of modality, timing, um, the format really of the support have you found or would you find most useful to set up or improve your business or leadership activities? Can I perhaps ask the three uh, rapporteurs to give us a two to three minute um, summary of what was discussed in your groups? Could we start with the English group, please? Yes, yeah, so English group, we were many people, but I just want to summarize. For we had a, we were able to respond to all the three questions. The first one challenges that uh, entrepreneurs face when they want to become entrepreneurs as women. One, we say lack of training. The right type of training is what we are talking about here. Then lack of market opportunities is also one. We talk about the lack of women being connected to the right people who will give them the right technology. Technology, simple technology like phones, internet use, how to assess information on smartphones is what we are talking about. Lack of credit, which is very important for women to be able to become very strong entrepreneurs. We don't have it. It's a serious challenge because of issues of collateral. Then uh, also another point we made has to do with very complex documents, even for you to use to assess collateral from banks, why even government make it possible. The, we are not able to interpret the document, so it's a complex thing. Cultural barriers that put women always at home as uh, the, being responsible for homes instead of also giving us opportunity to be able to become entrepreneurs and earn money. It's also a big challenge for women. And then the balancing whole household work and also businesses that women those who are entrepreneurs want to do. You want to do on pay or social reproduction work at home, and you also want to earn money. So that timing is always a challenge. Then also women, even what we do, nobody recognizes it. So it's also not a motivation enough for women who want to be entrepreneurs. Difficulty, importantly, in assessing information. We are in the information tech, uh, world, and if you don't have information, you hardly can move forward. So those are the challenges that we identified. Now, question: the second question, what can peer-to-peer -peer help to address? We talk about uh, it. It uh, helps us to avoid mistakes that others have repeated. It makes us very confident. It makes our aspirations and hope for women very, very high. It enhances knowledge. It also brings about innovation and efficiency. And importantly, as women in groups, we are able to provide solutions together and get results and own the results together. It's very important. So that's the point number two. Question two. The last question, what type of support are we asking for? We are asking for physical meeting as much as possible because it comes along with physical seeing their relationships are built there, their connection is better. Then it also comes along with the fact that we are able to have enough time to learn from each other better. Then we also suggested hybrid sessions. So this is what the groups came out with, and that is what I've reported. Thank you very much. Wonderful. That was a really insightful summary. Um, I would now like to, I have a, I've seen a hand up. Is Mary going to be the rapporteur for the Spanish yes. group? Wonderful. Please, the floor is yours. Sí, muchas gracias. En el grupo en el que estuvimos, algunas compañeras, bueno, hablamos sobre algunos desafíos, de, por ejemplo, relacionados al tema de las desigualdades, de, de estos espacios de participación, del racismo que nos afecta también, 
eh, a las mujeres racializadas, el tema de los efectos del cambio climático, eh, el acceso a, 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 a la, al tema tecnológico también. Entonces, en ese sentido, planteábamos que es importante establecer red de mujeres a nivel eh, global, que también podríamos plantear unas agendas políticas en donde nos veamos eh, reflejadas en nuestros eh, intereses ahí para generar algunas propuestas de trabajo y e impulsar estos emprendimientos en nuestros territorios. También eh, eh, rescatar este tema de la producción eh, con enfoque agroecológico y que vincula los conocimientos tradicionales de, nuestros, de, nuestros, de nuestra cultura, de nuestros eh, territorios a los que pertenecemos. Y lo que también eh, coincido con la compañera que me antecedió, el tema de, de enfocarnos de este trabajo con aliados estratégicos que nos han venido apoyando eh, por mucho tiempo para, para estos procesos. ¿no? Y eh, el tema también del acceso a mecanismos de, de financiamiento para los bioemprendimientos o emprendimientos que las mujeres eh, impulsamos en, eh, en nuestras organizaciones y territorios. Y esto también eh, transversalizar el enfoque de género para que podamos hablar sobre el tema de los derechos de las mujeres de, del acceso a la salud sexual reproductiva de las mujeres que también podamos hablar de nuestros feminismos de, de, desde nuestros territorios también incluso sacudiendo el tema de ciertas de normas y cánones culturales que también nos han tenido sometidas no a las mujeres entonces eso yo pienso que las alianzas para eh, las mujeres y para el intercambio y transferencia de conocimientos a través de las redes de mujeres es de, podría ser una de las respuestas y que a partir de eso podamos impulsar nuestros eh, en, nuestro, en nuestros emprendimientos y otros medios de vida en los que las mujeres nos vemos eh, involucradas en nuestros territorios. Esto sería, ah, y que también es urgente, el tema de una repotenciación de nuestros emprendimientos en este contexto post pandémico que, eh, que nos encontramos porque en un contexto de pandemia nos vimos afectadas en el tema de las violencias, en el tema de que no teníamos acceso a la salud, a la, a la educación y, y, y sobre todo a, a, a muchas cosas ¿no? de, de que, que nos vimos muy afectadas las mujeres. Entonces, en este sentido... Eh, eh, agradecer por el espacio y, y también eh, felicitar a las compañeras que han, a través de sus ponencias nos han eh, compartido sus experiencias. Muchas gracias, Yupai Chani. Wonderful, thank you so much, Mary. And now I would like to quickly give the word to the rapporteur of the French group. Alors, merci Katia. Je, je, je reprends au nom de Aïcha Ogosama. Je suis du Togo. Et nous avons travaillé dans le groupe en français. C'est vrai que nous n'avons pas eu beaucoup de temps, mais de manière ramassée, euh, nous avons relevé des défis pour, auxquels sont, sont confrontées les productrices. Donc, notamment, nous avons euh, le manque d'accompagnement et d'appui en équipement. Nous avons également l'importance du réseautage pour les groupes de femmes. Et nous avons aussi l'accès au financement et aux au services de crédit. Également, nous avons relevé euh, la nécessité de renforcer le leadership et d'accéder à l'égalité des sexes. Et également la sécurité foncière et puis l'accès à la technologie pour permettre à ces femmes-là d'être plus productives dans les activités. Donc, euh, pour répondre à la question de, euh, de tous ces défis, nous retenons qu'il faut que euh, ce partage d'expérience, ce mentorship dans lequel euh, nous allons, vers lequel nous allons, nous permettre d'améliorer nos méthodologies, nos actions et donc l'atteinte de nos objectifs. Et pour les types de formation, précisément, nous pouvons euh, aller vers euh, davantage de renforcement de capacités en gouvernance, en établissement de partenariats, en plaidoyer pour, euh, par exemple, l'accès à la sécurité foncière et la mobilisation des ressources. Je vous remercie. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Aisha. Thank you to all of the rapporteurs.